Um, welcome. I am Suzanne Katz, and uh, by day, I am a wealth management advisor at Maryland Wealth Management. Ooh, I did something here. Someone will help me with the technical aspects later. By day, I am a wealth management advisor at Merrill Lynch Wealth Management. I develop financial plans and implement investment strategies for people, many of whom are women and many of whom are entrepreneurs, so that they can achieve the life goals that are most important to them. And by night, among other things, I am on the leadership team of BNET, and it is my great privilege to introduce to you our speaker this evening, Srayu Srinivasan. Swayu Srinivasan is the founder and CEO of Cargo, an online consumer transport marketplace. She's a venture capitalist and advisor to companies in the US, Asia, and Europe, most recently serving as CEO of Americas of a global $30 million sports technology provider. Previously, she had been a director at Intel Capital, where she sat on Intel's Corporate Social Responsibility, Social Entrepreneurship Management at Intel, Surayu invested in international and cross-border technology businesses and moved to India to deploy Intel's first targeted $250 million emerging markets fund. Prior to Intel, Surayu helped co-found venture-backed companies, ran a strategy and growth acceleration consultancy, held C-suite roles at a series of early-stage software companies, and headed marketing for a converged communications Srayu began her career as a brand manager running the $300 million Mug Root Beer brand for the Pepsi Cola Company. Srayu held a research fellowship at the Harvard Business School in the areas of valuation, finance, and strategy, and was asked to join the PhD program based on her work. She has contributed to an award winning textbook, authored academic and practitioner's literature on investment technology and business, and is a frequent speaker on venture capital and entrepreneurship. Swayu is currently a practice fellow at the University of Edinburgh. In addition to her professional board responsibilities, Swayu also serves on the boards or advisory boards of Astia Global, Young Inventors International, and Question Box, among others. Her most recent claim to fame, of course, is her appearance on the cover of the most recent issue of Barnard Magazine. <laughs> And we are honored to have her speak with us tonight in this BNET's second event in our series on finance and companies. She will be uh, interviewed by Susanna Schwabstor, who is the Assistant Managing Editor for Time Magazine. Thank you. Oh, welcome, everybody. I'm so excited to be with you because for so many reasons, as we've discovered in our brief conversation. Um, I think that I want to ask you a really simple question to begin. The word venture capitalist can mean a lot of things. It sounds mysterious, and glamorous, and somewhat kind of um, unknowable. Can you give us your best definition of what makes a good venture capitalist and what is it that one does? Sure. Um, so a venture capitalist is somebody that basically provides funds to create a company and fuel growth. Um, it's basically been commandeered, I think, by the technology sector. So when you hear the word VC, it's usually associated with funding technology companies. So Apple, Google, Intel, all of them got venture money to start their businesses. So it's, it's risk capital. So how did you get to this place where you decided, I'm, gonna, I'm going to do this, I'm going to learn how to uh, choose the right companies, make the right relationships, spend money. Um, and I think my biggest question is, how do you balance that divide between research and your gut intuition and your relationship with companies? Um, so I, you know, I'd like to tell you that I was really preparing my entire life for this <laughs> career, but that's not what happened. Um, I think um, in the best of circumstances, VC is basically a white male dominated profession. Um, if you didn't go to Harvard, Yale, or Princeton, good luck getting into it. Um, that said, um, most people get in very accidentally. 
Um, it's probably, you know, next to private equity, uh, one of the most sought after jobs when you get out of a great business school because um, unlike private equity, it's a great lifestyle. Um, you work with really interesting companies, you meet entrepreneurs, you make decisions. Um, and unfortunately, there's no training in the apprenticeship business. So you get in because somebody decides to bring you in, um, which is sort of what happened to me. Um, it's a great job for women. Um, I think it speaks to all of the skills. I think women, by the way, are very tough. I mean, people always say, oh, you know, I mean, we're so nurturing. But I think it's actually great for the both of those things, being a people person, being sensitive, connecting to people, as well as sort of all of the stronger qualities that women bring to the table. Um, <clears throat> so I, I came to it, um, happened to meet the chairman and CEO of Intel, who's one of my current investors. and. Uh, he took a liking to me and, and said, why don't you come to Intel? I thought he was joking, so it took me like eight months to contact him. Uh, and ironically, his wife was very instrumental in this, and uh, I ended up um, going through the interview process and was lucky to get an offer there. So it was really, you know, in, in both cases, somebody taking a liking to me and bringing me in. Um, first, your second question, um, the divide between research and um, you know, this is an apprenticeship business and there's really no way to train for it. So you really need to have a combination of a gut instinct, you went on, but you know, they have a sense about businesses and what is going to make a great business and a great business opportunity and then they can match that with, are you the right guy to do that? So it's really, um, there is a lot of data and research that's involved, um, but this is an industry because we're at such early stages that all the research in the world can't guarantee that the company is going to be Google or Apple, and that's really what you're looking for. Um, you're looking for a huge return on your money. Um, so you know, research is, I would say, a significant part, but a lot of it is, you know. Um, taking that data, mapping it to what the market opportunity is, and then when a team comes to you that's in that space, figuring out are these the right team, is this the right product, is this the right team. Timing is a huge thing also. Um, you know, before the iPod, there was the Intel Pocket PC, and before that there was the Diamond Rio player, and I had all of those, like nobody remembers them, you know, now everyone knows what's not even an iPod, you know, these are iPhone to, to listen to music. So um, those things, unfortunately, had the wrong timing. And when the iPod came out, it was, you know, everything was sort of aligned. So, can you describe that initial meeting with a company you're interested in? And is it like a date where you kind of assess body language, composition of the team? What What are you looking for when you walk in the room and you meet them? Um, I certainly do, and I, I think that's a great analogy. Um, I really do sort of look at it like, and I say this to entrepreneurs too, I'm like, as much as you're afraid to go up and meet these, you know, these guys with like really big pedigrees and, you know, with from Pine and Perkins and Intel and, you know, you're, you should be judging them too. It, it is a day, and these are people that are going to be sitting on your board, and I mean, I mean, the way that I always think of it is, if this ship goes down, can I turn around to my partnership and say, I would have done it again. He's a great entrepreneur, you know, whatever the market was in right now, companies like that. Um, so it's really, can you, are you ready to go down? I think, I think of the worst case scenario, I think, am I, am I okay with this if they fail? Or am I gonna be like, oh my God, I should have never invested in them and he was terrible and blah, blah, blah. Um, in terms of first meeting, I, you know, it runs all over the board. Um, it depends. Um, I was based abroad uh, in Asia for five years in an emerging market, and because even though they have super long histories of business, I mean, kind of traditional venture capital is only about two decades old there. So I would have people walk in and, and say to me that they just needed three hours of my time, and I'd be like, you have you know, 40 minutes to explain your business. Um, and so a lot of what I found I was doing was also educating people about don't send me a 60 page business plan, it needs to be 10 pages. And they would say to me, but, but you know, I, it's 60 pages and I'm like, you have a consumer internet idea, it's not 60 pages, you can <laughs> bring it down to 10 pages. And by the way, that's a great exercise to get sharp about your business because nobody has time to read 60 pages. So, um, you know, each, 
I think each meeting is different. Um, oftentimes, I think you can tell almost immediately about the person. Um, you know, when they walk in, I've had immediately. Sometimes people surprise you. I've had that happen. But it's usually always a combination of the person and, um, you know, do you like the opportunity? And, and I wrote a piece on this about why people do deals. Um, it's like falling in love. You know, it's like if you walk into the room at my house, it's really hard. I will look to basically um, fulfill whatever my expectation is. I mean, even if you have like, you know, credit grids, haven't paid a bill, you know, haven't, you know, I've got like huge debt, I will be like, yeah, but you know, she didn't put herself to school. You know, you're trying to figure out like how to, you know, basically support this person. So um, I think that there is some. Uh, a little bit of that that kind of field of distortion that happens. Um, is there a such thing as an elevator pitch? Can yeah. it be that short? Yeah. Oh, yes. You need to sort of be able to sum up your idea in, in a minute. I mean, not even like elevator. I think literally the elevator pitch is if you are say a medical devices company and I'm trying to think of like these guys aren't but GSK. You know, you see the CEO in an elevator, you want to quickly tell about your idea and impress him in a minute and make sure that he takes your, you know, get his part and make sure that he reads your email. So it's really about being able to succinctly boil down the essence of your business to a line or two. What's the quality that you think you have that makes you good at this? Um, well, I think the <laughs> debate is, you know, still on about whether I'm good at this or not. Um, but. Um, so I know that, um, well, I, you know, com speaking comparatively, looking at my other partners, I know that some of my strengths, and by the way, these actually go across industries. They happen to be well suited for VC, but I'm very persistent. I don't take no for an answer. Um, I mean, extremely. And I mean, so if other people are like, Connor, are you humiliated? I'm like, no. <laughs> I, I mean, really, what, they can just keep saying no and sending the door on my face till they're like, we need to get rid of her, let's just say yes. Um, so, very persistent. Um, I think I'm good at reading people, um, and this sounds terrible, but I think I'm good at charming people. So getting in and, you know, have, getting that meeting. Um, and I think it's really used to come up on my reviews that although I knew nobody in Asia, and I was the only woman on the team, they were like, she's getting in to see people that the eight guys here that are, you know, honestly way more qualified than I all went to IIT and I am, which is like the Harvard, you know, super, super smart guys, been in the industry. They're like, nobody returns their calls, but everybody wants to see her. And part of it was just being very, you know, just sensing people to getting my foot in the door. Um, I think research was also something that I was strong at. Um, but I think really having the ability to judge people. Um, yeah. To get that first date feeling and be worried about it more often than not. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, that's right. What's a good success rate for a VC? Oh gosh. Um, so in the VC industry, um, as a rule, it's like the 80-20 rule, I said, but it's like 90-10. So like 90% of your investments go to the toilet, and then the 10% you're hoping end up being the Google or the Apple that make up for the 90 that are, I mean, you don't hear about all of the carnage. You hear about Airbnb, you hear about Uber, you hear about Lyft, you hear about Sidecar. Um, but for every one of those, there are hundreds of companies that fail. So, um, yeah, it's, you, you, you're you lucky if you have a couple of hits. The people, the, you know, the names that you may know from technology, you know, VC, um, sort of the ecosystem, are guys that have you know kind of consistently been you know investing in the sort of Ubers, the Facebook, Facebooks, the Airbnbs of the world, right? A little more than they've been wrong, which I think exactly. Is, yeah. Um, how do you recover from a mistake, you personally, or maybe just in the business? That's a great question. If you have too many of them, uh, your partnership will probably very politely or not so politely say, you know, it's been real, but you need to go. Um, there's not, you know, and that's why there's such a, there are very few, it's such a high turnover rate. Um, there's also a saying that it takes about 
seven years and $50 million to make a good VC because it's a slow path to riches. It's not like investment banking or private equity. You invest in a company and you help them grow and you really want them to grow really quickly and for them to kind of go public or get acquired in two years or one year or three years, but yeah, that doesn't happen. So you're basically sitting around and waiting for and, and you get most of your compensation in the form of carry from your firm. So it's a percentage of how well that firm does, whether it goes public or it's purchased. So it's not a you know short path to riches. Um, you know, it's not like you're waiting for your Goldman Sachs, you know, bonus at the end of the year. Um, but uh, yeah. Is there you you obviously have when you say work with these companies and help them succeed, there's an emotional investment. Oh, absolutely. So yeah. maybe you could talk a little bit about that, that relationship as, as you see companies go up and down. And yeah. Um, so I'm a little unusual, and I think this is also one of the reasons that I was, um, I, you know, I, I do pride myself on behaving like an operating executive, which most, many VCs don't do. Um, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of VCs invest and then they just kind of disappear. And I've heard that, but the best, you, you can really get money anywhere. And I advise this to people, I'm like if you don't find investors that you think are adding value other than money, just go get a loan. It's so much easier, you don't have somebody sitting on your board, you know. Um, but for me personally, I got very involved like an operating executive to the point that, I mean, I would cry with them, I knew the stories about their, they're mostly men, um, I knew about their wife, I had to, one guy's wife was on the board like, to tell him that she needs to go because we're a and he was like, oh my God, she's gonna kill me. And I'm like, well, you know, sorry, but but you know, we, we became super close. Um, so they're not only friends, they become like family, and I end up, I think, acting like a operating executive at their company without actually being at their company. And I really believe that, you know, there's usually a tension between the investor and the company but I believe that if you do what's right for the company, that it should flow back, that it, it comes back to you as a reward. It's not you know, a, a view that's always kind of supported, I think, by the funds, but, but it should be that way. It should be aligned so that, you know, what, that everybody, there's enough for everybody and that you know, our, their successes are basically our successes. Can you talk a little bit about working in India? and how the climate might be different there. Venture Capital, you said a little bit about how they were sort of new in the whole pitching process. Yeah. But in terms of operations and functionality, sure. Um, so I, I do a lot of public speaking, and um, um, it's funny, um, when I'm at like a big conference or something, and this comes up, you know, they want to know about emerging markets investing, I'm usually mobbed by like all of these business school students from like Harvard and MIT, and they're like, in the emerging market, and I'm like, you know, it's not as glamorous as I make it look. It's actually, especially India, is a bit of a nightmare. You have to have a lot of uh, kind of fortitude to be there. So people don't think about these things. But for instance, um, when you end up getting an apartment and stuff, you have to heat up your water. Like, people don't even think about this, but you have to heat up your water 30 minutes before your shower, and there's only enough in a small tank to either do your hair or shave your legs. So I paid an arm and a leg to become a member at the nicest hotel at the gym, and I just took all my showers there, like all hot water, you know, towels. But, um, you know, it's things like that that people don't think about. And so, you know, when you're dressed up and have, you know, a nice bag, people are looking like, oh my god, that's what I want to do. It's like, it's not as easy as, as it, you know, I'm making it work. It's also, you know, the lack of infrastructure um, in some of the emerging markets, that's tough. There are huge cultural differences, um, which I think as an American, you know, going anywhere, I think we're used to a certain business culture and um, a certain way of speaking, I think, um, and just a certain way of being, which is not necessarily how the rest of the world operates. And you have to be very careful because you can end up insulting people um, very badly and destroying business relationships. You can, you know, end up like, not realizing that you're offending somebody. There, there are just so many things that you need to um, watch out for. But the things that we take for granted here, I think, um, you know, you don't have over there. Another thing I say is I found a lot more diversity in the workplace, actually. 
um, which I really liked. Um, you know, there's all different kinds of people that are wearing all different kinds of clothes, and not everybody is wearing a suit and going to work, and so many different languages are spoken, and um, there is a really high degree of professionalism and autonomy among women in the workplace, which I actually found to be much more, much better over there, actually, than here in my industry. Um, you know, I think that you have to be prepared to have an entire life change. And certainly when you, we talked about living in France, I lived in France and I worked in Europe before. Yes, there's that culture shock, but take that and multiply it by 10,000. You know, the further east you go, and even though, you know, a place like India is really where kind of Western culture stops, and when you end up going more east, you're entering the Orient, essentially. It's still difficult, you know? It's a huge country and languages and so many different races, and you have people that are living in medieval times back to back with like the most modern person you want to see. And that's all a part of the fabric that you have to accept. I mean, nothing happens on time. And for somebody like me, that's a nightmare. Like I would have entrepreneurs coming to me for money that would show up an hour late. And then act when I, I, it just took me so long to get used to. And I remember I would get angry for the first like year. And they would just sit there going, okay, well, are you going to waste your time being angry? Or do you want to talk about business? And I'm like, he's right. Like, I can sit here. And people are just like, you know, people don't say sorry over there. It's not that they're not sorry. It's just not, you know, you don't say sorry. So, you know, I'd call my mother furious and I'd be like, you need to say sorry. <laughs> And you know, my mom would say people say sorry and thank you in different ways, with their eyes, with their demeanor. Not everybody's gonna say sorry, thank you, and not mean it. You know, I mean they probably meant it, they just don't express it that way. But um, you know, so so changing the way that you are and adjusting, I mean, I think it's you uh, you have to in order to be successful in, in that, that kind of business climate. And it's worth it. Oh yeah, I think so. I would advise anybody, if you have any chance to work abroad, to do it. Uh, I mean, go everywhere you, you can, and if you have a chance, I mean, the, the more you know, different it is, I just, I think it's so exciting, and it changes your life, and you meet so many interesting people. Um, and uh, gosh, I think it just, it changes you. I, I come back to the United States viewing the US very differently, and I've been, I was very well traveled before that, but certainly, living there for five years and spending all of my time in Asia or Europe, I really came back to the United States, I think changed in a lot of ways. You talked about diversity in India and the role of women. Let's come back to the United States. Sure. And you know, we think of VCs as you describe them, as right, nice middle-aged or sometimes young men in suits, mostly Caucasian, mostly of a particular uh, education. Where do you fit into that? How do you sit on boards? How does that change any of the way you operate? Or do you just plot past it? Well, um, as I mentioned to you, I grew up in a household with a mother that was one of the first women on Wall Street. And she was one of the, she was a, the, one of the first female fellows invited to Harvard. And she was a Miss Hawaii. And so I grew up with a mother that was, you know, pretty, to me, normal. And the more I kind of ventured out into the world and realized, oh, uh, there's not really many women. She, she tells me all the time, she's like, there were no women working. She was when I, she's Indian, and she would say that when she started working at Wells Fargo, she was like, there was no women. It was shocking to me. There were no women in the US. So I grew up with, um, you know, just not even thinking about gender issues. Um, I've now realized in retrospect um, that a lot of stuff that happened wasn't. And I'm still like that. I just never think of it as my problem. I'm always just like, I don't know what he's acting like. <laughs> but, um, and you no, know, it hasn't changed my, my um, behavior on boards. Um, I actually think it's a very powerful thing to be a woman in BC because there are no women. So, you know, if I walk into the room, guess who gets all the attention? Everybody wants to talk to me. I um, can, you know, connect with these guys because they're so bored with each other and <laughs> sitting on a board. <laughs> Also, and you know, people will talk over you. Um, you know, I'm not afraid to dress up. I'm not afraid to wear makeup. I don't really care what people think. I'm gonna be who I am. I think, and that was very true in India, you know, you are judged on your work, 
not what you look like. Nobody cares if you have wrinkles. Nobody cares if you're five foot ten and gorgeous. Nobody cares if you come to work wearing a kurta, which is the Islamic. Nobody cares. What are you producing? You know, that's it. And that's that's just kind of the way that I grew up. So I don't think about it. You know. Yeah, and that reminds me that in the tech industry right now, how they value companies, how there's a lot of smoke and mirrors, there's a lot of yeah, show uh, versus do, and you must have to be one of those people that to see through it and say, hey, this is where the real value is, and this is, you know, to get past that, because I think there's a lot of PR. Yeah, absolutely, there is a lot of hype, I mean, around, I mean, we all know Facebook's story, uh, you know, there are a lot of, you know, it's one thing to be an Apple or an Intel that's actually producing products and having a huge value, which people love, you know, I mean, it's so funny, you get on the subway, I mean, now it's just normal, but every now and then I just, God, every single person is on their phone. Every single person is on their phone. And 90% of them are, I think I'm like the only person here who doesn't have an iPhone. Like everybody has an iPhone or an iPod or they're there with you know a tablet. Um, those companies, you can see the value, you know, and you understand why they're valued the way they are. But you look at a Facebook or you look at a Twitter. You know, I live on Wall Street, so when they went public, there was like, you know, that huge, I mean, it was nice to walk by and uh, you know, see the huge Twitter thing, um, their symbol on, on the exchange, but um, there is a lot of kind of speculation and driving things up and all of, you know, to be very honest, I think people um, want to make their money when the going is hot and it's it's really, you think this is going to change the world, but you know, half of me is like, is it? <laughs> is Twitter going to make it better? Then the other half is, yeah, I mean, there are, um, you know, people that have used this for social revolution in other parts of the world, but it's certainly a phenomenon that's very American, and the rest of the world sort of looks to us and wants to imitate. Like we are, we have become sort of legendary for creating Silicon Valley, not just in Silicon Valley, but in New York, now right. in Silicon Valley. What do you think makes good uh, entrepreneurial culture? Is it culture to culture? Because we've seen various mayors and cities try to say, oh, we're going to start an incubator here and we're going to yeah. attract all the kinds of people that do the kinds of things that you say that are difficult to reproduce in another country. Yeah. But what makes that successful? You know, that's a great question. Um, I'm, I'm not very popular for saying this, but I don't think New York is a great tech center. Um, and um, obviously the Valley, I think Boston is ahead of us in many ways. Um, and there's really no reason for it. Um, you know, if you look at New York, um, you've got, you know, I say this all the time, it's just like become road. It's, you know, you've got two major universities on either side of the island of Columbia and, and, and NYU, and, you know, Pace and Hunter and City, and all these other great universities in between. This is the fashion capital of the world. It's the media capital of the world. It's the financial capital of the world. In New Jersey, you know, there's an argument to be made that there's all of these great healthcare, you know, things that are happening. Why the hell aren't we producing companies? And, you know, I was here in 98. I got offers from about.com, boo.com, all these companies that probably don't exist anymore. And it was the same feeling, you know, different day. Everybody was like, we're up and coming, and this is the alley, and whatever. And now, like, I don't even go to these tech things anymore because I'm like, <laughs> loving. People are like, what about Instagram? I'm like, that was one. I mean, can you name, and like, who even knows about, you know, can you name anything else? So, and it just, there's no reason for us not to be better. Um, and, you know, like, I applaud people like Mayor Bloomberg. He, he announced, like, a $100 million, $300 million fund right before he left. Yeah. yeah, and I spoke to their office, and I basically said, I just said what I said to you, and I was waiting, I was, like, cringing for the night, and people were like, how dare you? You know, New York's awesome. And he said to me, I violently agree with you. He said, I absolutely, the mayor thinks the same thing. We gotta get it together. So I don't know what the answer is, but it's like we're playing at being entrepreneurs. You know, everybody's like, you know, girls like cool, and let's be that. I'm like, that's all great, what are you doing? You know, like I haven't left my apartment in eight months because I'm working, like I don't go to these things. Um, and I don't know. Um, it's, it's not like Stanford. Where, no. I mean, I think Condoleezza Rice, we really had an event at Time Magazine year, and she talked about the efforts that they made to kind of create uh, an inter 
disciplinary feeling there, where if you're in graphics, you're also in tech, and you're right. in, you know, the, it all kind of mixes together, and they have figured out some magic. That's by the MIT model, yeah, you know, which has created so many, like, billions of dollars of value, you know. Um, but I, I just don't get it, because everything, I always, I call it, I said, this is a primor primordial stoop. We are, we, I'm still waiting for life to come crawling out. All the elements are there. I'm like, come on, where's that fish? Come on. But, but you don't see it, you know? And I, I don't get, like, why that is. I, I don't know. Maybe you'll change it. And speaking of, yeah, will you talk a little bit about your company and sure. how you figured out this was the time for you to jump in? Okay. Easy. Um, <laughs> I basically could get arrested. So I decided to start this company. But, um, so I just founded a company called Cargo.com. It's K-A-A-R-G-O.com, and you can all post like that. We have it. We're just building that product right now. Um, it's an idea that I had about two years ago. Um, I thought I needed a partner to start it, and I kind of was looking, cycling through people, and was like, no, 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 that two or three people I wanted to work with were already doing their own things, and so it kind of went away, and I was also thinking, somebody will show up and do this, and this is such a great idea, I would invest in it. And nobody did anything. And I, I was like, okay, either this is a really bad idea or this is really difficult to implement. And it's a very simple idea. We're just creating a way, a new way to ship things. Um, and we're in the sharing economy, so we're in the same space as Uber and Airbnb and Lyft and Sidecar and all of those companies. Um, and we basically are allowing people to use their cars to ship things for other people. So it's a different way to look at things. It's um, an alternative to UPS and FedEx. Um, it's greener because it's not a discreet trip. It could be cheaper. You could send you know, heavy items, oddly shaped items, things that need to be hand carried. So you know, especially think about the college route. I'm sure a lot of you, live, your families live in other parts of the United States. You want to get your tuba back during Christmas. You can just go on cargo, see who's coming in, and ask your parents to, you know, get it to that person or have them pick it up, and they can ship it. So we thought that, um, you know, I, I knew this was a bright idea, and I was kind of cringing and waiting for somebody to start it because I couldn't find the right partner and. In the interim, I got recruited to become the CEO of the sports company, moved back to New York. I was in Boston for a year um, after leaving Intel. And uh, I really started to seriously think about this, and I thought, you know, maybe there, I, I should start this. So I, had a, I, I called up quite a few friends that were VCs and entrepreneurs, and had very serious conversations with them. And I just thought, right, I gotta do this. And then I raised the money and I started it. Um, and yeah, we started, I think, really in earnest last summer and we're just about done with the product. I just heard from one of my investors, we're gonna demo it to him in like uh, a week or so. So yeah. So here it comes. Yeah, yeah. Did it feel odd to be on the other side of the table pitching? Yes. No, I'm not pitching these, I'm not raising any VC money. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not going to VCs. Oh, and, I was uh, going to say, because you raised money, but you got investors just to do that. Yeah. I got, I, my investors, um, I took money from private individuals, I took money from the uh, former CEO, Chairman of Intel, Craig Barrett, and then I took money from Andrew Tisch, who's the Lowe's family, um, and the Tisch School of the and they're old friends, and I very specifically uh, went to them because I knew they would stay out of my hair. But that's also the flip side of that is, they're staying out of my hair, like they're not gonna help me. If I'm like, my house burned down, they're like, well, I'm gonna go meet, you know, Malala for the Malala fund. I'm like, okay, bye. <laughs> or my lawyer ran off with everything. You know, they, they're not gonna be able to help in this sort of granular issues, but that's why I went to them. Um, I wanted people that knew me that would invest in me um, and basically leave me to work on the product. Um, I think there's a time and a place for VCs. Um, I don't think it's now. Um, so I, I really, I went to about uh, a dozen, a little less than a dozen individuals, and I was very fortunate. I had about 10 people or so that wanted to invest, and then I started to narrow it down. If The nice thing about being on this side of the thing is if somebody, if I felt like they were gonna be trouble for a little money, I was like, I don't want him on my board. I don't want him. And so I got, you know, I took the guys that have been incredibly supportive and um, really helpful in, in other ways. 
um, and uh, yeah, have not taken any institutional money yet. How many hours a day are you working? All the time. Yeah, it's like, I can make my own hours, um, and I don't need to really be anywhere at night. Or, but the fact is that, you know, I have, I was just up in Boston visiting my mother, and she was like, I was on the phone with my CTO for six hours, like three nights in a row. That's normal for me. And she was like, he lives in a different country. And so I, my mother's like, oh, that's so much. I'm like, that's nothing. And she goes, when does he work? I'm like, I don't know. He just has to have this stuff on my desk by like the time I get up tomorrow. Um, and so you're working all the time. Um, you're taking meetings all the time. Um, you know, it's, and at the, but at the same time, there's a little bit of flexibility, you know, that I can kind of make my own schedule, but it's pretty much all the time. I, I think that um, that seems to be the common denominator that the, the, what you were saying before about being in BC is a lot of work as well. There's no, there's no, it's not that much work. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of pressure. Okay, all right. <laughs> it's a lot of pressure to invest right. somebody else's money and then you have no real control over, you know, what's, I've had everything that could go wrong with a company, or I've had a CEO die, I've had a CEO go under, I mean, that's pressure, but it's really a great lifestyle. Um, I loved it, and I had to, I had my deal calls happened at like four in the morning, so I would have to get up like two or three, um, and then I'd have a two hour call presenting my deal to our committee sitting in Asia, and our committee is in the US and Europe and in uh, other parts of Asia, and but I loved it. I mean, I loved every single piece of my job. Um, it is so rare to hear what you just said for most people. I love every single piece of my job. I loved it. Oh my god, it's the best job. And it's such a great job for women. It's yeah. such a great job for women. Why don't we open this up to questions? I'm sure you guys would love to know more about how she ended up here, what we were mentored for, if you have any, anybody? changes to equity, um, you know, it hopefully it changes to equity, that means the company is doing well. But um, yeah, no, we, we give you money for ownership um, in your company. And then there are different flavors of strike. It can get extremely complicated. Like, you know, we did an Intel where you're just like, this is $2 million. <laughs> it's like, why? There's a 60 page chart sheet. But, um, and it can be one, I mean, for instance, my own company, I, they don't want a page term sheet. People are like, what? And I was just like, this is what we're doing. And one of my investors I walked away from because I didn't like the fact that he was having it hawing. And I was like, look, it's too early to be doing this. Don't. And he's somebody extremely prominent, just like the two other guys. I was like, I was like, you know, he's like, I'll invest in your next round. And I said to him, right, when I don't need the money, like, don't worry about it. You know, like, well, I love you as an advisor, don't worry about it. Um, but I did like a super simple term sheet for this because I just said, it's too early. I don't want to deal with, you know, all of these uh, crazy structures. But within, you know, you could have all different kinds of flavors and all different kinds of instruments and make it sort of as complicated or as simple as, as you, you'd like. Hi, good evening everyone, I'm Nita. And um, I'm uh, based in the food industry. That's in Indonesia where I come from. So I'm here just visiting friends and I happen to know this um, seminar going on. Um, so my question is that um, I heard a lot about venture capitalists going into te uh, like technology industries, uh, but I haven't heard of any venture capitalists going into the food industry. So I'm just wondering why. Is it because it is too risky? Because I do hear uh, people saying that it's just way too risky and can't really put a number whether this business will go well or not because taste and preferences are very different. That is the best um, Well, first of all, the word venture capitalist is almost exclusively associated with tech. 
Um, when anybody says VC, I never think food or automobiles or it's a high growth, it's a Silicon Valley high growth, you know, style of investing. Um, I'm giving you a little bit of money today in the hopes that, you know, in a very short period of time, you're going to 10x my money. I'm going to get 10 times what I put in. Um, so you want to see growth like a Facebook or an Uber, you know, I mean, these are the big examples today, Airbnb. Um, you know, people, there are private equity firms that invest in food and all, but they specialize, but I would, and they may say it's venture capital, but when you say VC, very specifically, I think the association is always with high tech. And that's everything, hardware, so it could be a food industry online, it could be anything, but there's gotta be a technology component to it. You know, it can be in the cloud, it can be, you know, a device, it can be, uh, you know, it can be software, consumer internet, healthcare, can be anything, but there's got to be kind of a fast growth technology. And when you think about food, it's not really something that's a fast growth. It's not about the risk. It's it's risk is a part of it, but that's more of a business that you are building over time. And you know, it's not you kind of yes, there's a risk involved, but it's it's really it's it's very different. The nature of the businesses are very different. Um, but you do have investment firms that focus on those areas. I wouldn't call them venture capital uh, businesses. Hi, I'm Lauren. I'm co-founder of a clean tech company. Um, so, so far we've raised money from wealthy individuals, angel investors. When do you think the right time is to go after VC money? Like how much money and at what stage in the company? Um, I think uh, it depends. Um, it depends on whether you're ready for VC money. I think it's probably a little bit of a different, there's gonna be different expectations. And an angel investor will be really happy if you sold your company for $10 million, you're gonna get a great return. I'm gonna be really pissed if you sell your company for $10 million. I wanna see you sell it for like $500 million. Um, so there's a little bit of a different expectation. I think there's a little bit um, more pressure um, in a way. And then when you deal with institutionalized investors, I mean, but now it's like everybody's becoming this way. I think the expectations are a little bit different. It's like more, I hate saying this, but it's, you're it's probably going to have to report quarterly or whatever way they, you know, to them. You're going to have to have board meetings. Um, it becomes very institutional. You're, it's a company. Whereas an angel might just give you the money and be like, let me know what's knowing. Like, like my investors, like, you know, I, I'm literally the one that's keeping them up to date. I just sent a note to Craig and you know, you know, and just said, look, I've got something to show you, but he's not following up with me. Like he's, you know, just like don't wipe clothes with it. I don't leave my apartment. Don't worry. But um, yeah, so I think it, it depends. Um, usually, uh, companies take in VC money at a point where there's an inflection point. They're either about to grow in a huge way, so they need to do hires, they need to expand their offices, they need to hire you know, certain experts, whatever you know, is going to support that growth. Sometimes they do it because they want, um, certainly this was true at Intel, they want a brand name behind them, so the fact that Intel's invested in you. I've had companies take money because of the, the individual venture capitals, like in this case me, they wanted me on their board, and they also want the Intel name behind them because that gives them some credibility when they're like, yeah, Intel invested in us, people are like, oh, you know, they sort of sit up and take notice. So there's that branding aspect. Um, it's it's a number of different reasons, but I would say that those are probably it's it's when you're ready to grow, when you when you really need to raise the money, or when you want, I think, some legitimacy. And that was very true in emerging markets, I think. But here too, I mean, it's a sign of it's a badge of honor to say Kleiner was invested in my company. You know, it's like a big deal. It's like, wow, or Andreessen Horowitz, even though, you know, or whatever the top VC companies are now. And is there a good way, or maybe there's just not a good way to kind of cold email a VC who you think might be interested in your company, but you don't know personally or don't know someone who knows them? Um, you know, they always say a warm introduction is better, and obviously I'm willing to, um, you know, if a friend calls me up and goes, hey, I met this great girl, she's got a healthcare, and I'm like, I want to do healthcare. And she's like, would you just talk to her, please? I'm gonna take the meeting from my friend. Um, 
But the truth is, I think if you're really doing your job as an investor, you will meet, I used to meet with everybody. I mean, with everybody. And my partners were not like that. I used to get complaints all the time, you know, like, oh my God, or so-and-so didn't return my email, and you know, different styles. But for me, I felt that there was some, I always learned something out of the meetings. And guess what? You may not be somebody that I'm interested in investing in, but because you had a good experience with me, you may, you know, when Janet starts her company, you may go like, you know, I got this really great woman over at Intel and you should really talk to her. So there's no harm, I think. It's a matter of time and resources. Like, do, do I have the time to meet every single person? But um, I think a warm intro is great, but I really think if is also important if you have a great idea and you have your heart set on a particular investor or a firm I would just keep banging on their door until I mean they're so you know Scott McNeely rejected I think from Stanford or Harvard Business School three times he found it he found it some microbit systems right I think you know I mean these are all there are lots of stories like that out there where people turn down um, Union Square Ventures turned down Airbnb and they actually keep a box of the cereal. You know, they, they sold cereal to keep them afloat for like a year or so. They keep a box of the cereal in their conference room to remind them, we passed on these guys, you know, we screwed up. Because that firm has a great reputation for betting on winners. So I think being persistent, being professional, um, I would just keep, I've sometimes had to send um, 12 emails call again and again, never show that you're annoyed that the person didn't respond, you know, and you just need to get your foot in the door. Um, so I would just be persistent, but I think warm is probably a better way. They're supposed to be responsive, by the way, that's their job. People aren't necessarily, but you're supposed to, res you're supposed to respond to everybody. I uh, thank you for coming in. I uh, actually have a number of questions. I'm going to try to limit it a bit. Uh, but I wanted you to maybe elaborate on uh, why you said that it's a particularly good job for women. And also, I was wondering if you invested alongside your portfolio and why you might have chosen some investments over others personally as an angel investor and how long before you think you can assess if you were a successful VC or not. Okay, so your first question was, why is VC a particularly good job for women? Um, I think it really speaks to women's talent. Well, first of all, there's just not that many women in it, so that makes it a great industry because you stick out like a sore thumb. That doesn't bother me at all. It might bother other women, but I, I think it's great. I'm not intimidated or where I'm just like, yay, the only woman here. You just get more attention, you know, both good and bad. Um, and I think it speaks to a lot of our skills. And again, um, you know, I think that women can be, first of all, great communicators, great negotiators. I think we read between the lines in ways that men, men are like clueless. I mean, absolutely clueless. You know, you're, I'm like, you know, I'll say to one of my male partners, I'm like, why did you keep saying that? Couldn't you see that he was getting pinched? And they're like, no, I mean, right. And I'm like, the guy wanted to kill us, you know, and, and my partner's like, oh, I didn't notice at all. Um, I think women can also, you know, be resourceful in a way that men aren't. You know, you can kind of connect dots and things. Um, you know, I'm not going to say the things that people say that women are compassionate, caring. I've actually never found that at work. but. Um, I think that it speaks well to all these things, communicating. And again, it's a great job, like if you want to get married and have a family or have a real life, this is a great industry to go into. Um, you know, you can kind of set your own hours. I had partners that didn't even come into the office, like ever. Like we had to have like a come to Jesus meeting where our boss was like, guys, seriously, you need to come into work. You can't just like disappear for two weeks and work from home, you know. But because you have to be out on the road, you have to be meeting companies. So um, it's a great lifestyle. Um, uh, um, I think uh, profession, um, but I think it really speaks to certain talents. And then your other questions were: Do I co-invest? Yes. Did you invest alongside your other investors when you were at Intel? Yeah. Okay. yeah. I led all my investments, but I had other other uh, investors and also we share deals like when you're friendly with somebody like Sequoia or whatever they would bring me something interesting 
or XU that they were trying to unload, <laughs> um, and, and the other way around. As an angel investor? As a venture capitalist, as a, okay. yeah. Um, and then how long before you can assess if you were a successful so, like I said, they said seven years. I think the joke is seven years and fifty million dollars, meaning the firm has to invest fifty million dollars in you through the investments that you're making, and seven years to see if you have a hit. Some people are very lucky, but um, it's a this is a long term business. It's not investment banking, you know, where you, everybody's going to get a great bonus at the end of the year. Or if the firm does well, then if you do well, you know, woohoo! But yeah. VC is, you know, you get your salary and then you're waiting and waiting and waiting for the company to exit. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kim Tran and I do, I do institutional sales at JP Morgan. Um, I was wondering if you can recall a specific moment when you decided, I'm going to run cargo, or if it was just a longer process when you just vetting where you just fed in your idea with your with other entrepreneurs or others in your network and you just kind of ease into it? Um, well, you know, when I came up with the idea, I tend to have a really, really good gut about ideas. And, and I think that's why I went into this industry. I'm like, I just know when something's going to work. And I was like, this is a great idea. It's going to work. And this was two sort of running this other company. Um, and when I left the company and I was here in New York, and it was clear to me that I did not want to work for a VC firm here. And the hedge funds and private equity firms are actually quite interesting, but they're in a very different business, and it's more of an issue of them looking at me like I have two heads because they don't understand venture capital. It's it's we're all private equity, but we're on the early side, and they deal with mature companies and going in, you know, as you know, and restructuring things and using debt, and that's not our game, so they don't get it. And I thought, God, what am I doing? Europe's a disaster. I would have loved to have been doing VC deals in Europe, but Europe's not doing great. Don't want to go out to the valley. So it was really just kind of like, okay, what do I do now? And then, you know, I wish I had like a more glamorous story, but it was, I started to go and talk to friends of mine, uh, some extremely seasoned investors at well known firms, um, some pretty successful, you know, young entrepreneurs. And was basically like, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And, and every single person, you know, was basically saying to me, "You don't need a founder." You know, and I was like, "Yes, I do." I was crying in some guy's office. One of my friends, I was like, "Yes, I do. I can't do this." You know, and he was like, "You don't need a founder." He's like, "Just go building." And I'm like, "No, I don't know how to." And he was like, "You'll figure it out." I'm like, "No, you know, I need help." And I just kind of convinced myself that I can do this alone. And then when I went to my investors and started I started to get an idea that maybe I could and I sat down with friends of mine that were entrepreneurs and was like tell me the steps and they did and then really for me when it really came together is when I said let me see if I can raise money to do this and I went and I started to talk to investors and I it came incredibly quickly for me I raised my money very very fast and I I was very lucky um, and that's very unusual too um, they when they started to show some confidence in me, I thought, okay, I'm gonna go out and build a mock-up, and I'm gonna see where this goes. And I mean, you know, and based on that mock-up, we raised the money pretty quickly. So it was really between those two things, having those convert, it was, I didn't know what else to do, and this idea was bugging me. Having enough conversations with people that were like, you will regret this if you don't try it now, and frankly, your time is running out in the sense that, you know, if you end up, you know, with a family, whatever, like, it's going to be difficult. Um, and then having the investors sort of confirm that they were interested in this as a concept, you know, and then there was, like, no turning back. Uh, so it was, it was, I think, of multiple things coming together. Thank you. Hi, I was wondering if the matrices in which you measure success in emerging market companies are different from the way that you would measure success in the US because of capital market development in emerging markets or lack thereof. That's a great question. Um, no, it's the same thing. I need to see 10x on my money or whatever the, the bar is. Um, the challenges are different. It's much, much harder to build a company in India. When people here complain, like I'm like, you know, vomiting, I'm like, 
are you joking? Like, it's so easy here. Like, I've gone through it now, and I'm like, it's so easy. And it's so hard there for so many, so many different reasons. Um, and liquidity is really difficult. Um, so there's a great, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with, you probably are, the Hotel California, the Eagles, where there's a line in that song going, you can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave, that's India. You can't get out. Like once you invest your money, it's like, okay, I don't see, like how do I get out? So there are a lot of challenges, but the bar is the same. We all want to see, you know, a return on investment, preferably, you know, 30, 40, 50, you know, like a huge, a huge number. And I guess the follow-up to that is um, how much competition do you see in emerging markets or frontier markets for venture capitalists and women venture capitalists? Um, I, competition, uh, you mean, other what? Firms. Uh, uh, other firms, like when you were at Intel, other firms going against the same deal? Oh, absolutely, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Intel has a very different reputation over there than it does here, which helped me a lot. Like, people are like, oh, Intel, they really want to have Intel investing in them. Um, so we competed with everybody from Blackstone, KKR, the private equity firms, all the way down to angels that were also trying to get into the deal with the traditional Sequoia and Kleiner Perkins. And so um, there is a lot of competition. And then you, your second, you had a. No, that was, that was it. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I was also wondering, sort of a follow up to her question how do you define the line between adopting to the culture that you're doing business in in emerging markets and not adopting best proven practices that you're used to. Um, Is that hard? How do you? I mean, for instance, when you're when you're there and you're doing business, and you know, you might you said you're used to the American way of doing business, whatever, and you're used to, uh, used to things that have been proven to work in the way that you do business in DC. Now, when you're adapting to the business culture there, how do you know when to adapt and when to work to get the environment to adapt to, adapt to you? Um, you get hit in your face till you're sick of like your face is bleeding. And you're like, okay, I don't think I want to get hit again, so I'm going to change. Um, that's what happens. I mean, I stopped. I still yelled and screamed about everybody being late. I, I tried to control my immediate environment. Um, so, you know, I, I come from a family where, you know, I was never given a car, I was expected to walk everywhere and take the subway, and that's who I am still today. I mean, despite all of this, I always say I might carry a better handbag, but, so, you know, for me, I ended up having a driver, which I, was very, very unusual for me, but they always come late, they, you know, disappear for a week, and I really depended on him because I needed to get to work every day at seven. And um, these guys are my buffers. I had two of them, and I, I, trained them so well that they were like my men Friday. So that I could control. So I had a little bit of sanity there. You know, they were always there and they were my family. And, but I would get into work and I had no idea if somebody's gonna show up late or, you know, not show up at all. And you know, you end up having to adapt. Um, you can yell and scream, but guess what? Nobody cares. I'm gonna lose my voice. People that think I'm a jerk, you know. So I think you fall down and you pick yourself up and you fall down and then you just learn where you push, where you don't. Um, it's, it's survival, it's just, yeah. Um, I remember you said that it doesn't matter how much makeup you wear or what this looks like, just really that you do your work. Mm -hmm. I just wonder to what extent maybe even, maybe race has come into play for you. Um, I'm curious as to if it did, maybe where you might have met the, ro the most roadblocks, if any? You know, it's actually, I haven't felt any, I actually don't even feel discrimination as a woman. This is horrible, I sit on so many boards of women that some of them just don't even understand what they're talking about. And when I actually had to say in the last meeting I said, I was like, guys, the fact that we're on, this is an organization for women, can we stop talking about how to help women, duh. I mean, everybody knows when they come to us, it's only women. <laughs> so we don't have to keep, let's, can we focus on actually getting these guys to be good entrepreneurs? 
And so um, for me, I've never had like um, an issue with, um, I've had issues, you know, interestingly with being American, everywhere, ever in Paris, in India, you know, not good and bad, but you know, I, I mean, not necessarily good or bad, both, but you know, in France, like anytime, you know, uh, you do something that I'm like, oh, I didn't do that again. And I'm like, uh, I understand French, so. And you know, in India, they'll be like, oh, she's so American, you know. Um, but I really just haven't been aware of gender or ethnic or any of those issues. Yeah. Um, one other question. Um, I'm just curious, to what extent has this been lucrative for you? You don't have to give us personal, I'm sorry, I've just, I've just been curious, and how, you know, to, based on how long you've been doing this, I, I'm curious as to how long you've been doing this as well. Um, well, I'm not, I made a good living. Um, I made a very good living. Um, I wasn't focused on the money, though. Um, when I left my previous partnership and went to Intel, I actually took a 60% pay cut because, six zero, because um, going to an emerging market, they were like, oh good, we can get her for cheap. And so literally, they, everybody's like, why are you taking this job? You're getting paid what you got paid in college, you know? And I was like, no, 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 I want to do this. And very fortunately for me, within two months of my being there, the head of Intel Capital because he was losing talent, decided to standardize all the salaries globally. Everybody started to get carry in their deals. So I was just very lucky. Everything changed. It was like I was sitting at home and, and making an American salary, paying, you know, cost of living there is really, you can live really, really well. Um, so, you know, I saved up a lot of money and stuff. So for me, it was fine. But yeah, no, I didn't make the um, hundreds of millions of dollars because I, didn't, you know, I left, I left my, and so you leave, when you leave your firm, you leave all the carry and the investment and everything, so.